فصلي وسلم وبارك على نبينا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين وبعد So today this is the second uh, uh, session uh, within the seven episode series that I'm going to run inshallah ta'ala uh, uh, ca- uh, tackling uh, disbelief and the sources of iman and how to kind of deal with uh, modern day uh, challenges that I think uh, most uh, younger people will run into if they haven't already done so uh, within their studying uh, facilities or whether at work or just with friends and just maybe just being exposed to the uh, to the wild world of the internet um Right, which is what I think WWW actually stands for, but probably doesn't. Um, yesterday we talked about, I, I, when I went, through, I went through the basic reasons or the common reasons of, of disbelief, and I unpacked a few of them that I think are important, and I'll refer back to them every once in a while. So I would advise you listen to that first uh, session well and kind of have an idea. And I went through some common fallacies, which is also be referring to some of them, inshallah, as we go along, because they're important. And then I pointed out the four sources of Iman and maybe what... Uh, what it is that we base our arguments on. So today I'm going to, I'm going to tackle the concept or the uh, source of the universe. Um, and I'm going to go through a number of, of points that I think inshallah will be helpful for, for us. And then I'll, I'm going to take on what, a common fallacy that, uh, that is used uh, when, when we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and I'll call, unpack that as well. Hopefully when the time will allow me to do these two things. So when we talk about the universe, there's a source, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, it's, it's all over the Qur'an, so I really don't need to go through verses, but uh, example, in Surah Al-Mulk, الَّذِي خَلَقَ سَبْعَ سَمَاوَاتٍ طِبَاقًا مَا تَرَى فِي خَلْقِ الرَّحْمَانِ مِنْ تَفَاوُتْ فَارْجِعِ الْبَصَرَ هَلْ تَرَى مِنْ فُطُورٍ ثُمَّ مَرْجِعِ الْبَصَرَ كَرَّتَيْنِ يَنْقَلِبْ إِلَيْكَ الْبَصَرُ خَاسِئًا وَهُوَ حَسِيرٌ Mada fis samawati wal ard. Go, you say, go and look and see what it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in the cosmos and on the earth. Which is what we do. And that's why, the, and, and because of the, the frequency of these verses in, in the Quran, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to look at the universe, it's, it's considered the, the first uh, uh, source of Iman. And, this, and, and it's important that this sequence is observed. When we talk about sources of Iman, you need to go sequentially. You start with the universe, you start with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already created. I'm going to go through a couple of, um, of challenges or thoughts. I'm going, to, I'm going to basically unpack this or talk about it by just going through a couple of, the, a couple of challenges or obstacles or, or arguments that exist against yani, using the universe as, as uh, evidence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Again, I just want to make it very clear that I ta- yesterday I talked a little bit about scientific proof. Scientific proof, which is materialistic proof, which is mechanistic way of thought, for, for something to only be um, a fact for you, if, if it comes through mechanistic thought processes, or uh, for it only to be a fact if it comes through scientific proof or materialistic proof, that has never been the case. Meaning that, that's never how the world actually ha- has worked, and that's not how we have come to conclusions in terms of factual um, scientific uh, uh, concepts. It's not through that. Um, uniformity of evidence is. Uniformity of evidence is what we use. And that's an important concept, and it's different than scientific proof. I got the question yesterday, but I, I, was, I wanted to talk about it today, so I kind of went through it quickly. But this is very important to understand, that what we, what we talk about when we, when we talk about belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we're referring to that concept, we're looking at something called uniformity of evidence. Because scientific proof, by default, can never exist. It, it's, not, it's, not, it's, it's not possible, because science can only give us the existence and the mechanisms of things that, 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 uh, that are floating around within the observable universe, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not. So you, you, it, science does not have the ability, doesn't have the tools to actually offer you any proof. But uniformity of evidence is what we talk about, is what actually exists, and it's much more powerful than scientific proof, by far. When you have multiple sources of evidence that are all pointing in the same direction, that is actually much more. And in, when I talk about uh, the Islamic narrative, if there's one piece of evidence that is not uniform, is not direct uh, pointing towards the, to, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you can, you, can, you can basically get rid of the whole thing. On the other hand, scientific proof always has a margin of error. Always. Always. The most clear scientific facts always have a small margin of error. Maybe less than 5% or even less than that. But it's still there. Uniformity of evidence leaves no way for us to be, to be in doubt of something. Which is what we actually uh, uh, argue exists when we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is why we have to identify what are the sources of evidence. Here are the four sources. And then we look at them. Where are they pointing? 
Are they pointing in an opposite direction of God? Or are they all pointing in the direction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is it enough for one of them to be pointing in the opposite direction for us to say, it's not worth uh, holding on to this. It's not worth believing in this. But we don't. We actually see it to be the opposite. Everything, all the evidence, there's uniformity of evidence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of the existence of God. And because of that, we, don't, we, have, we have certainty. We have certainty. If it was scientific proof that you were going after, scientific proof actually doesn't offer you full certainty. It offers you a really high probability, but not certainty. And that, anyone who does research knows that, knows that just based on, on you know, the, uh, the metrics and measurements that are used to actually come to conclusions. So a few arguments that exist out there. Is, this is the first one. The first one is they claim, or they'll say this, they'll say, um, the burden of proof of God is on you. Because you're claiming that something exists, and since my, my, my senses don't reach it, so the, the burden of proof is on you. It's not on me. I don't believe in anything. There's no burden of proof on me. You're the one who's saying there's a God. Well, prove it because I, I, there's a burden of, proof, the burden, of, burden of proof is always on the person who is making a claim of something existing, correct? That's what the, the argument is. There's a, there's, a, there's a fundamental flaw within this argument that, is, that goes unnoticed. I, there's something called self-evident truths in the world, right? There, there, are, there are conditions for something to be called a self-evident truth. First thing, it has to be universal. I mean, it has to be something that exists for all people, no matter where they are. It can't be specific to a culture. It can't be specific to a time. It can't be specific to a, uh, to a religion or a race or a part of the world. It has to be universal. It has to be something that is not taught. Meaning it's not something that is going to be taught to someone. It's just going to be a part of their common sense. Meaning something they're just going to grow up with. It's going to be clear to them. It has to be natural. It has to be something that is not artificial. It's not something that happened after the, uh, the, the, man, the hand of man uh, mingled with it. It's something that's a part of nature itself. And it has to be simple. It has to be the most simple explanation. And this is not, again, this is not a definition that is religious. This is just when you talk about self-evident truths. Well, any self-evident truth has to meet these four, uh, the criteria, these four criteria. It has to be universal. It has to be simple. It has to be natural. And it can't be something that is taught. It's not something that you just, it's a part of your common sense. So anyone born into the world is going to end up having one of these self-evident, uh, this self-evident truth because it's just something that is natural, just comes to them normally as a part of their instincts, as a part of their comprehension of the world around them. So that being said, what are examples that most philosophers or all philosophers, forgive me, and scientists actually believe or accept as self-evident truths? For example, the existence of the past. Have you lived in the past? Has anyone from the past come and spoken to you? Then how do you know it ever existed? The past, meaning before you came along, before Hadrat Janabak was expo expo brought into this world and you blessed the world with your existence. How do you know that everything before you actually happened? See, that's a self-evident truth. Because you don't need anyone to teach you that the past happened. It's just, you know it does. It's just, it's just a, a self-evident truth. It's natural, it's universal, it's simple. I'm not the first thing that exists. There are things around. There must be. So that's a self-evident. Another example is the, the existence of external minds. I have a consciousness. I'm conscious I'm here. The existence of other consciousnesses is, is self-evident. But I have no proof of it. You talk to me, I have no, I, I, there's no way for me to prove that your consciousness is there. No matter what you, how much you speak to me, no matter what you do around me, I still don't have concrete proof. It's a self-evident truth that you are, a conscious, are as conscious as I am. That's just accepted. The simple law of causality. Th these are all, by the way, these are all you know, uniformly accepted by, by scientists. I'm not, I'm not adding my own thing in. There's no fallacies here. I'm just adding, this is what they talk about. The law of causality, something happened, something caused it. That is accepted universally. We, when you see something you know, that, that has occurred, you walk into your house, everything is broken. The law of causality will tell you something was there. You don't need to be taught that. It's not something that is artificial. You walk in, something is moved or changed around, not the way it was before. Someone did it. Someone, something did it. There's something, there's some cause that, that, that put that there. The simple laws of logic. I am either um, uh, Canadian or Portuguese. If I'm not Portuguese, that means I am, right? You just came to that conclusion. Your mind just jumped to the conclusion. No problem at all. That's self-evident. That's, that doesn't require any, that doesn't require being taught. There's no, it's very simple, it's, it's universal, and it's a part of nature. So these, these simple laws of logic are a part of the self-evident truths that exist in the world. So the problem with this argument, when they tell you that the proof of, the, the burden of proof, forgive me, the burden of proof is on you when, you when you claim the existence of God, well, it comes down to two problems here. Number one is that when you deny the existence of a creator, I'm not talking about 
a specific God, okay? I'm not going after a specific description. I'm saying someone or something that put the universe into existence or into motion. That's what I'm talking about here. It's just, we're going to broaden the, the definition. Something that caused this to be. So when you say that, no, this is just here, it, it doesn't, nothing caused it. Well, the burden of proof is now on you because you have just taken a self-evident truth, which is the law of causality, and you said that it doesn't, it, it's not going to apply to this. The burden of proof is now on you because you are taking a self-evident truth and you are limiting it and saying it doesn't apply to this. So you have to prove that, that this self-evident truth, which is the law of causality, does not, apply, does not apply to this world. And if you can prove that, then that's a different story. But if you can't prove that, then I don't, that, I don't have to prove to you the existence of a creator. That concept comes already, it's, it's, it's a part of us just existing. Because we're here, and because other things are here, in the universe, when you look at it, it exists. The fact that it exists means that there's a cause for it. And that cause is what we claim to be the creator. As Muslims, the cause of all of this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. So if you're going to say there's no cause, then the burden of proof does not lie on me. The burden of proof lies on you because the self-evident truth is there. We don't need, this is something that's accepted all over. And that's one, that's one of the basic arguments that exist. It's probably the most common one. And it's based on a simple fallacy where, where, where yes, the evidence of proof is on the person who's claiming the existence of something. Yeah, but there's a little bit of a, there's a caveat here because you're saying, uh, you're saying that, uh, that this self-evident truth does not apply to this. And to make it even clearer to you, if a murder happens, if, some, if someone is killed, the burden of proof on who did it is on the pros uh, prosecution. On who did it? Not the fact that someone did it. Is that a difference here? On who did it? Yes, the burden of proof is on the prosecution. They have to prove that Fulan did it. They don't have to prove that someone did it. That's a self-evident truth. The guy was stabbed 15 times and there's a knife beside him. They, I don't need to prove, I don't just start by saying, well, first of all, let's prove that the knife didn't do it on its own. Let's see if we can prove that the knife did not jump up and, and shove itself into this person's guts 15 times. And then we'll go on. No, that's self-evident. Obviously, someone did it. The prosecution has to prove who did it. So for Islam, when we're talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're talking about the one who caused the universe to exist. I don't need to prove that someone did that. You need to disprove that that happened. Now, the details of Allah subhanahu wa that's a different story. Now, the details of who God is, that's a whole, that's a different thing that we'll come to, inshallah. So that's the first point. Second point. There's something called, I'm not sure if you've heard of this, ever heard of Russell's teapot? So, yeah, so, and, and, and this is what, uh, what Dawkins talks about in, in, in his book, God, uh, The Illusion of God, or God, God Illusion, whatever, whatever he calls it. He, he talks about Russell's teapot. Russell is a, one of, one of, is, a known, is a known philosopher. He talks about the existence, this is what he said. He said, this is what he says. He said, there's a, there's a micro teapot that is um, circulating the universe or circulating somewhere between Earth and Mars. And this teapot is, it cannot be picked up by any telescope, cannot be measured by anything. And it's the reason that everything exists, it's the creator. That, that small teapot is the creator of everything and, it, and it's circulating uh, the Earth between Mar Mars and, uh, and the Earth and it's very small, it can't be picked up by anything, and it's the creator. He said, he, this is what he, his argument is. His argument is that there's no difference between what you're saying and what, what I'm claiming. I'm claiming this and you're claiming that. Well, there's again a fundamental problem with the argument. A teapot does not fix the problem. I mean, a teapot does not explain anything. When I say, when we say that there's a creator, there's a reason, there's a cause of all of this, we're answering a question. The question is, why is this all here? Where did this all come from? Where did it come from? There needs to be a cause. So when we say there's a God, and the concept of God is creator, someone who, who is actually able to put all of this into motion, I am answering a question. I'm offering an answer to a question that exists. When you tell me there's an invisible teapot, you're not, answering, you're not offering me an answer. Because teapots don't do anything. Teapots can pour tea. That's as far as they go. They don't really create anything. So for us to draw the parallel between these two arguments is actually you know, fundamentally flawed because a teapot does not explain the existence of the universe. You're just saying, well, the only parallel that, that they're drawing with this, uh, with this argument is that, well, just like you can't see God, you can't see my teapot. Yeah, I, I understand that. But I'm telling you that the God that I'm speaking of is the one that put all of this into motion. What did your teapot do? What exactly does a teapot do? If you say, well, my teapot created the universe, then we're back to the same point. You're claiming that something created the universe. You're just defining it, you know, based on your level of intelligence that is a teapot. And I'm looking at it as something a little bit much more, or much more, you know, uh, random than, than that. But we go back to the same point again. So, the, again, these are 
a lot of these arguments that you'll find that go against the faith that will sound very silly because technically some, many of them are. And they're just based on simple fallacies, just simple lack of use of, of, of basic uh, granular uh, linear logic that you really need in these type of situations. The, the, the concept, but it's a big deal. Yeah, and you'll be surprised the amount of, 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 of traction the concept of Russell's teapot actually gets in the scientific world as, as an argument that is, very, that is very sensible, but it doesn't offer an explanation of anything. The answer that we are offering when we say there's a creator, it offers an explanation. It explains why things are here, where they came from. You have an explanation. The existence of a teapot does not, yes, it, it, there's similarity in the terms that you can't measure it, you can't see it, but it doesn't offer any explanation of any sort, so it's really, it's a, it's a dead-end you know, uh, argument, but it's there. Another argument, and this is a 6,000-year argument, it goes even before that, the something called Qidam al-Alam, which is the, the ancient aspect of the universe. I mean, the universe is old, it has no beginning. Saying that the universe did not start. The universe has always been here. Because when we're saying the law of causality, we're saying this is here, so something might have put it here. So what put it here? And they're like, no, 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 this was always here. Nothing started it. It's always been there. Well, we don't have to actually waste any time philosophically uh, uh, disproving that because science did that for us. Jazakumullah khair. Funny enough, funny enough, uh, science actually took care of this argument for us, so we don't have to actually go into it. Because, uh, because science, uh, the, the laws of thermo thermodynamics, for example, or something called the BVG theorem, you can look it up if you want to read a little bit more about it, it very simply explains that the universe has been in a state of expansion. And anything that continues to expand with the material that it has within it cannot be infinite in nature. There has to be a beginning point to it. There has to be something that started. This is the simple laws of thermodynamics. It can't, it can't, it, it could not, the, the universe, based on the scientific measurements that exist within it, the, what the scientists have come to, is that it's impossible for the universe to have been infinite. There has to be a beginning point. Just the way that it expands, the way that it moves, it's not possible for the universe to have always existed. The universe definitely, which is why, what is, what is the most uh, yeah, any, uh, probable theory that exists for the universe is called the Big Bang Theory, right? That there's a point in time where it all started. And, 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 and the question is, well, why do we need a point? Because the, the, the laws of thermodynamics, and, and, for, and I want you to take some time to read the BBG theorem if you have time, you just go through it because it's, it's very, it explains things quite well and it gives you a lot of, a, kind of a nice scientific background for it, is that it's not possible for the universe within the way that it actually exists, within the rate that it's expanding for it to have always existed. It started at one point. At some point, it, it, it began. And that takes away, of course, this very, this is an ancient argument. This goes back many, 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 many years ago, many, many millennia. And subhanAllah, it, only, it was only fully debunked in, you know, recently, like debunked scientifically where I don't need to actually have a, a, a philosophical arguments. There are a lot of philosophical arguments that will debunk this theory of the, uh, the ancient aspect of the world, but we don't even need to go there anymore because scientifically we have evidence that there's, there was a starting point. How long ago is difficult to, uh, most scientists think it's around something 14 billion years ago, this is where we think um, so roughly there, that's where it all began. We don't know for sure, but we know it's something at that point that it began. Scientists actually even believe pretty uh, concretely that at some point it will also end. I mean, just like as it expands, at some point it will come to a, um, to a plateau point and then it will contract amongst, uh, upon itself again. Of course, that could be billions of years away, but this is what they still believe. Point after that. There's a theory called the theory of the multiverse. Ever heard that? The multiverse? Yeah. So the multiverse is one of the, to me, one of the most interesting um, arguments that exist out there. And the reason that I think it's interesting is because it has zero evidence to support it. It is nothing but wishful thinking. There's nothing, not even, not a speck of evidence that this is even a possible theory to out there. But because enough scientists that, are, again, science is what brought us a lot of the, it brought us this microphone, it brought us the, the lighting, and he, he brought us the internet. We love science. Habib the science. We love him. He brought us so many, so many easy things. We get to drive cars. We can fly in planes. We get to do so many things. So we respect science, which we should. And then we respect those who actually stand in the you know, worship within the, 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 the tomb of science. So when someone who is scientific, who is doing, working you know, within science, comes up with a theory, people tend to listen to it. Aside from that, I have no explanation for why it is that the multiverse became a theory that is so popular within, within scientific realms. Because there is zero, there is zero evidence to even su you know, suggest that it's possible. First of all, you're, you're suggesting that there's not maybe two universes similar to ours, or three. There's an infinite number. Infinite. I'm not talking about millions. 
I'm saying infinite number of universes, meaning it never ends. There's no end to it. Now, the moment you say something's infinite, I don't see the difference of your argument than what I'm trying to explain to you about Allah. Like the moment you even, even say the word infinite, there's no end to something, then maybe, maybe we should come back, come back to this drawing table, uh, yeah, drawing board and sit to the, at the table and talk a little bit more. Because based on what are you saying something is infinite? What evidence do you have there's an infinite number of universes? It's a really cool idea. I love Rick and Morty, don't get me wrong. It's fun to watch. It's a fun show. But it, obviously the concept itself has no there's, there's no, there's no scientific basis for something like this. I like, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a, a Canadian philosopher by the name of John Leslie. And he has, there's something called Leslie's Firing Squad. Uh, he, this is, this is a, th uh, a, a, a thought that he kind of uses to explain, because the multiverse is just a way to explain our existence in a way that gives no, uh, no reason for it to exist, I mean, no cause. He just, there's an infinite number of universes, so if, if there's an infinite number of, of them, one of them must be able to, to, to have life exist. One of them must be, because, and so that means we're just here based on that zero point a million trillion zeros point one chance that we're here, and we're, we're just that universe that ended up having life in it. But that also tells you that there's an infinite number of life forms existing in all the universes because it's not, it's, uh, we only need enough universes for our um, uh, probability to exist. You're saying infinite, that means there's an infinite number of universes that have an infinite number of creations. Again, the, the whole concept itself is, is, you know, lacks any form of, of logic to it or science, but that's the, the theory they have. So he has a nice little way of, of kind of uh, pointing maybe a flaw in this way of thought, which I don't think we need to actually point out. I don't really honestly think this is a, a, a theory that's even worth uh, any talking about, but because it's so widespread and because some people you know, who are very uh, prominent, like uh, Hawking, for example, Stephen Hawking was one of the uh, pioneers of people who really did stand by this uh, way of thought, and he thought this was the, the, you know, the, made, made a lot of sense to him, yeah, regardless. But the, the, the Lisley's firing squad is, it says the following, that if, you were, if someone was, was, uh, was going to be executed, standing in front of the uh, blindfolded, and there are 50 marksmen, right? All of them with their, with their rifles or their snipers pointed right at the guy, and they all shoot at the same time, and somehow the guy doesn't die. Not one bullet hits this person. So one of two things. Either it was just luck, or they didn't want to kill him. So which is it? Those who take the concept, or th those who take the choice that it was just luck, what is the probability of this being just luck? Is that acceptable? Is that an acceptable argument? Is that an acceptable probability or possibility of, of 50 marksmen and they still don't hit him? So he says, well, let's take it the opposite way. Instead of thinking of 50 people shooting one guy who's standing as a not moving target and they're all well trained and not hitting him, that we were hit basically by the bullet of life, right? This, this, this planet or this universe was hit by the bullet of life. What is the possibility of this being just, just of luck? Out of, it's a cosmic bullet that just going through all these galaxies and all these universes and is directed just to Earth, it just hit Earth and we ended up alive. What is the probability or the possibility of that being luck versus there being something that actually wanted us to exist? And I think it's a very simple argument and it does make, to me, a lot of sense. There's really not much to cut. For us to, to imagine that somehow we exist on a point million zeros, point one, chance of existence, and that's the explanation that we're going to go by within a multiverse that is infinite in nature, that we have no evidence to support whatsoever, versus there's a force that wanted us to exist. There's a cause for our existence. I think when you look at both arguments, you're like, this makes, yeah, this is much more simple. This makes much more sense. And, and the, thing, the thing is, again, the uniformity of evidence continues. We don't just take our iman from universe. No, no, we're going to go to life, and then to history, and then to our personal, and then you'll see, okay, Okay, there's too much here. There's too many lines. Because I'm not sure, when was the last time the multiverse tried to communicate with us? When was the last time the multiverse presented itself, or explained itself, or spoke to anybody, or sent anyone, or, or had any interest in, in being in communication with anyone? So you'll find that, okay, the, the evidence is kind of stacking up in one direction, rather than, than a theory that has nothing to support it whatsoever. It's just there. That's number four. Number five. So there are... There are theories out there that say, and this is what Dawkins says, is that we just popped out. This is the theory that he has of the world. I mean, we just, we just popped out into existence. We're just, we're just here. That's it. There's nothing, there's nothing else to ask. That's it. That's it. Krauss says yeah, he, the universe created itself, which is even to, even to me even more bizarre. But then this theory that sounds kind of crazy that we just popped out or we created, so, created ourselves, like the universe created itself, 
gained a little bit of momentum in the era of quantum mechanics. Once quantum physics became much more you know, widespread, it became a field that people looked into and, 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 and respected, this became much more of an argument. Yeah, that we, we just kind of popped out and that's an acceptable explanation for why we're here today. And they used quantum mechanics to explain. And I'll tell you why. So this, is, this, is, this is important if you don't know much about quantum mechanics. I actually took a, a, a 12 lecture course uh, that was, it's, on, it's online, it's for free, and it's given by, I think, the university, I can't remember what the university was, was it Stratford? Oh, I can't remember anymore. What is it? Maybe it's Oxford, I can't remember. No, it's in the States, it's not, it's not in the UK. But it's, it's a long, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a long uh, course, and I, just, I took it just because I, I, I was tired of hearing the word quantum, and I didn't understand exactly what they meant by it. So I, actually took, I took this long course, and I listened to stuff, and I have this, uh, all these notes at home. And when, when you come to, down to the basic of it, just the basic, it's very interesting. It's obviously very helpful. And, and quantum computers, once they, once we're able to actually develop them appropriately, will be very much, much more powerful. But the concept of quantum mechanics is that there's something called virtual particles. And, th and this, is, this follows the um, Heiden, Heiden, Heisenberg's uncertainty law, meaning there are virtual particles that exist in a form of matter and then don't exist in a form of matter. They're existing in a form of wave, meaning something exists and it doesn't exist. Exists and doesn't exist. So because they were able to measure these virtual particles at moments where they existed and moments where they didn't exist, they said, well, you see, you don't really need a cause for existence. You cannot exist, and then you can exist. That means the universe just exists. Ah, we win, and they walk away. They drop the microphone, and they walk away. Right? That, we win. We, we were able to prove that there are particles that will exist, and then another moment they won't exist, so they go into existence and out of existence, and that means that the universe does not actually need something to, make it, to, to cause it or to bring it to existence, so these particles uh, prove the, the, the point. Well, there's a number of fundamental problems with this argument. First of all, what they call the, the for, or the state of non-existence, they call that the vacuum state. And that vacuum state, most scientists don't believe that it doesn't mean it's non-existent. It just means that we don't have the tools to actually measure how it exists. All it means is that we don't have the tools right now to measure the fact that it does exist. And that's a big difference. For example, if someone has breast cancer, I can do a full panel uh, uh, blood work, a full plan. I can take over 250 different pieces of blood work, and I will not be able to detect breast cancer. Just because all of my blood work does not tell me that less breast cancer is there does not mean that they don't have breast cancer. It just means I don't have a marker yet that tells me that breast cancer is there. That's all this means. Is I haven't developed a marker that will able to detect something that we know is there. The person has breast cancer. They already have it. We do a full blood, blood panel. There's no difference between this blood panel and someone who's healthy. You have no difference. Does that mean the person who's healthy has breast cancer? Or does it mean that the person who has breast cancer doesn't have it because the blood panel doesn't show it? You understand know what I'm trying to say? This is very simple. So the fact that we can't measure the existence of something at a certain moment doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means that we don't have the tools to, 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 to actually measure it. Let's put that aside. Let's say I'm wrong, that we have the tools and it doesn't exist. So when these virtual particles are moving from a state of existence to non-existence, and they're going back and forth, are they following a law? They say, yes, this is the law, and this is Heisenberg. Okay, okay. So it's following a law. Let's stop there before you tell me about Heisenberg's amazing idea. Let's put that aside. You're saying that they're following the law? Okay. Anything that follows a law cannot have existed on its own because there's a law that's dictating its movement. There's a law that is dictating it. There's a law that controls it. So it can't have created itself because there's a law that's already dictating whether it's there or it's not. So that law has to have pre-existed in order for this to work. So anything that follows a law of any sort cannot have created itself because you need something to actually put the law into motion. It's implied that this is, again, these are, we go back to the self-evident truths, simple logic, just simple logic. If something is, is, is dictated or controlled by a law, well, then that thing could not have existed without the law. It can't predate the law. It can't predate the law of its existence. That law has to predate it. Very simple, the law of gravity. We don't predate that. We didn't exist and then the law of gravity. The law of gravity has always been a part of space-time. It dictates how things work. Are you understanding what I'm trying to go by this? The law of gravity dictates how things work. Without the law of gravity, as, they say, as we know today, if the law of gravity was just slightly stronger, the universe would have not expanded. And we have stayed into that little atom thing that we were part of. And the, the Big Bang. If the law of, uh, of gravity was a bit looser, then we would be flying all over the place and there would be actually no, the stardust would have never turned into, into, uh, into planets or stars or anything because there was, no, there was not enough, not enough uh, pull, not enough pull. 
So this law predates the existence of everything. It's there. You can't create your own law, the law that will control you. That's just a simple law of logic. So and it's just something so you understand wh where I'm coming from. So when we talk about the virtual particles within quantum mechanics, they, need, they don't prove or disprove anything. They're just another scientific phenomenon that we've observed that we will continue to research and understand and figure out. It doesn't tell us anything about the fact that something, that the universe could have existed from nothing. That's, that's not what it explains. But it's a very well kind of used yani, argument. And for, for not a good reason, yani, but, but it's there. So let's go back to, to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about in the Quran. That, that we kind of went through. These are the basic fallacies or the, 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 the common arguments. There's a lot more. I know. Maybe you probably, there's a lot more arguments. But I, honestly, I, I, for, for the purpose of this and so that I don't you know, I completely lose my voice by the end of Ramadan, I'm going to just go through the, the common ones, the ones that I, I think that are most uh, you know, talked about and that you'll hear a lot about within realms that, of studying or work. So I think it's worth talking about. If you go back to what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk about? He says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ سَبْعَ سَمَاوَاتٍ طِبَاقًا The one who created three, seven layers of, of heaven. And the word seven here doesn't necessarily, and I'll talk about that later, inshallah, towards the end of the course, or the, the sessions, that seven here doesn't necessarily mean a number. Seven is the symbolism in Arabic of, infin, in, in, of, an inf, uh, of, of repetition, of inf, in, infinity. Whenever you finish the seventh day of the week, what happens after that? We all die, and everything ends? You just go and start again. It just keeps on going. So seven is, is the symbol of things just keep on, re the, the repeating system. Six is the symbol of, of a lot, and seven is the symbol of infinity. It's just, it's just the way the, uh, the Arabs use these letters. So seven or, or numbers. Seven or numbers, I mean a lot, in, in, to a certain degree, to our, in our measures, something that is almost infinite, which is what khalidina means in the Quran. Something that is way beyond your ability to actually quantify or calculate or measure within your brain. Libaqa, one over the other. Ma tara, and this is the point of the ayah. Ma tara fi khalqi rahmani min tafawut. You won't see in the creation of Allah any discrepancy in terms of the laws. There's uniformity of laws. All the laws apply to everything. And that's a self evident truth, but that's what he's asking you to look at. It's really interesting what the Quran tells you to take a look at. The Quran says, just look at the simple stuff. All the laws that dictate the universe are the same. Ma tara fi khalqi rahmani min tafawut. Farji al basara. Look again. Do you see discrepancy in between what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made? And then look again. Look even deeper. You'll find that you're, you'll, you'll, you'll come back to yourself and find out that there's no discrepancy. All of the, there's uniformity of laws that, that, that govern everything that exists in the universe. That's number one. Number two, وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ لَيَقُولُونَ اللَّهِ وَلَئِنْ سَأَلْتَهُمْ مَنْ خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ وَسَخَّرَ الشَّمْسَ وَالْقَمَرَ لَيَقُولُونَ اللَّهِ The causality thing. If you ask who created all this, where did this come from, what is the starting point, then they say Allah. Not as in our God specifically, even though it is, obviously, but as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the force behind existence. So it's like, when you want to talk about the force behind existence, we define that force as Allah. It's not the other way around. You know what I'm saying? We're not saying Allah is the force, we're saying there's a force behind existence and what we call that force, we name, the name of that force is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's who He is. He is the force behind all of this. So that's how Muslims actually look at this whole issue. The problem with the belief in a supreme power and, and, and a deity comes from, I'm going to give you the, the this is what I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you as an example of a fallacy. This is an example of a straw man fallacy. Most scientists who don't believe in God, they don't believe, it's not that they don't believe in a force behind the universe. Einstein did, and I'll talk about the Spinoza element later on in this course, inshallah. Um, Darwin did. And most, most renowned scientists historically have believed in a force and a supreme power and a deity. Their problem was not in believing in God. Their problem was believing in the biblical God, or the Old Testament God, or the one of the gods that exist in the scriptures that have been around for a long time. And this is a good example of a strawman fallacy, because when they go after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us, they're not going after our understanding of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. They have made a strawman. They have made a picture of God that, is, that they have pulled from different scriptures and different faiths that have a very yani, manipulated version of God, and they go after that version. So God is God. But the thing is, we, we haven't even, yani, within the world that we live in there, we have not been able to explain the Quranic explanation, the Quranic narrative of who God actually is. We are stuck, we are clumped up with a bunch of other faiths that have a very distorted version of who God is. 
that the scientists say, we're not going to believe in that. And we're like, I know, I agree. We don't, we don't believe in that either. But because we don't have the ability to set ourselves apart and say, that's not how we see God to be in the, to begin with. That's not how we believe who we, that we don't believe him to be that to begin with. We're stuck with this Strawman fallacy where they go after God, but they're not going after the, our narrative of God. They're going after another narrative of God. I'll give you an example, which is, and this is the, the, you know, the, probably the most clear example in terms of the Strawman fallacy for this, is it that you seem meaning when, when God is described as closer to human, as closer to his creation in the Old Testament and in the Bible. Again, we believe that the Old Testament and the Bible were sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We just don't believe that the versions today are actually what he said subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's a lot of manipulation. Uh, 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 and probably the most clear pieces that were manipulated are the descriptions of the Almighty himself in the Bible and the Old Testament. So you find in the Bible and the Old Testament, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has talked about as, some, as someone who walks and wrestles, and gets angry, and cries, and fight. This is how they describe him. They talk that he comes into the world, and he, and he exists within the world, and, he, and obviously the Christians go beyond that, and they, uh, Jesus himself is, is, in their understanding, is, is God. And yet he, he bled, and he lived on earth. And Where does this all come from? Before I talk about the fallacy and where we kind of differ. This all comes from the, the innate need to understand why, why text was manipulated to begin with. Because you're like, well, why would human beings even manipulate their own text and, 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 and put God like that? I'll tell you why. Because human beings don't like the idea of God. Innately, the human being doesn't like it. Doesn't like that we're so limited and he is so unlimited. It's not fun. It reminds us, because we're, what are we described as in Islam? We're described as what? Ibad, right? Ibad, we're, we're servants. We're creation, we're simple creations, we're here to serve. Now that's not too attractive, is it? Unless you understand the Khalifa part, which you're supposed to understand in Islam, where it makes it, it balances it out, it makes it makes it much, much more easy to, to accept. But that we're creations, that we're simple, we don't like that. So one of two things we do. Either we try to godify or holify human beings or humanize God to, to close the gap a bit. That's why we love Marvel and DC. It's a lot of fun. Because it's really nice to, you know, to, in, to imagine that you can fly, or you can you know, shoot lasers out of your eyes, or that you can you know, morph into something different, or, you can, or that you don't need oxygen to breathe, or that you are invincible, or you know, whatever it is, whatever, you know, whatever superhero you like. Interestingly enough, the most loved, beloved superhero is Batman, who can't do any of that, right? Just interesting enough, again, for the same reason, because Batman will beat some, sometimes. So he's beating demigods. We like that. We like the idea of a human being beating a demigod and taking out a god somehow with his intelligence, quote unquote, or with his, even though he's mortal. So either we humanize God by saying, no, no, he's like us, he gets upset, he has a wife, he has a child, he has, uh, yeah, he, the, the, he fights with others, he gets up, he, these descriptions that are human-based, which takes away the, yeah, he, the immortality and the divineness and holiness of God, or we try to improve ourselves. Now, outside of comics and, you know, and movies, we can't really improve ourselves. It's not something we can do. Like, we don't have the ability to do that. We're stuck with the, the limitations of our, of our bodies and what we can do. So the, old, the, the, the second best thing is maybe we just bring him down a bit. Cut him down a notch. Make him a little more. That's why people like uh, pagans like Ibadat al-Aslam. Because the rock, they can go and they can touch the rock and the rock doesn't speak back to them. Right? So it's like, yeah, they're gods, but we take care of them. Right? We, they live in our homes. We... We have a little bit of control. We want to have control. We want to have control. We want to believe that we have all, you know, full control and that we're not, we're not second degree. We're not servants. No, we're, we're somewhere in between. We're not, we're not that low. We, we have some say in stuff. They say, like, I mean, I'm very shy. The Quran says, no, you don't. You don't. You don't. That's not how this works. So that's where it's coming from, just to understand where it's coming from. So when you look at the, the description of God in the, in the Old Testament, in the Bible, and other, yes, a lot of it is mujassam, is mujassad, meaning he is brought similar, he's humanized. He's turned into something that is flesh and blood, that has similar emotions to what human beings have. When you take the Qur'an, the Qur'an does not have that narrative. The Qur'an says, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ nothing, nothing is even remotely similar to him in any way. Nothing. Nothing is similar to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ Sorry, forgive me. وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ And he is the all-hearing and all-seeing, right, right in the same verse. Don't you hear? Don't you see? Yeah. And he's all-hearing, all-seeing, but it's not like you. It's not the same, that's why the verse is there. Nothing is similar to him, even though he's all hearing and all seeing. Because when you think of hearing and seeing, you're imagining eyes, you're imagining ears. No, don't. Because he sees and hears, but not like you. Or you're not like him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Listen to how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is how the Quran describes Allah. Allah nuru samawati wal 
مثل نوره كمشكات فيها مصباح المصباح في زجاجة الزجاجة كأنها كوكب دري يوقد من شجرة مباركة زيتونة لا شرقية ولا غربية يكاد يكاد زيتها يضيء ولو لم تمسسه نار نور على نور Allah is the enlightenment is the light of the cosmos and the earth it's light upon light and he describes to us the amount of light that exists that is not humanized والله الذي لا إله إلا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور you have 15 descriptions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in three verses at the end of surah al-hashr that remove Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any form or manner from being similar or existing within the same realm, universe, time or space that human beings exist within and that is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is described in the Quran هو الأول والآخر is the first and last. Well, how is that even possible? Well, if time doesn't apply to you, it is. Well, Vahir wal Batan, he's the apparent and he's the hidden. Well, how does that work? Well, if space doesn't apply to you, that, that works as well. You understand where I'm, where I'm coming from? So when you recite these verses in the Quran, the, the narrative of God that you're given is a narrative of a divine existence that transcends time and space and anything that we have in our lives. But the human being is not very good at connecting with something of that nature. Which is why you have in the Qur'an descriptions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So these are the types of descriptions of Allah. There are sifatullah, his, his attributes. Kareemun, Rahimun, Ghafoorun. These are the attributes of Allah. And then you have something called af'alullah, the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَبَعْضُهَا يُوهِمُ الشَّبَهِ And some of them can give you the illusion of... of um, of resemblance to human beings, like al ghadab like al rida like al istiwa similar, uh, the word ghadab means wrath or anger, rida means satisfaction or, or pleasure, istiwa is when some, istiwa, when, you, when, when you're balanced on something, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use these words, ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arshi istawa, radi Allahu anhum, you'll use these words, these, these verbs, so these, do these verbs mean that he's human? No. Then why are they using the Qur'an? Why, well, if he doesn't use verbs that you can comprehend, then you, you don't understand anything about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There has to be a, some degree of usage of words that you can register with. Something that is relevant to you. Something you can draw a parallel to. You have to be able to do that or the human being mind does not comprehend. If I tell you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a divine uh, existence, and there's no similarities, there's nothing you, can, you can't understand. You don't comprehend what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will use certain words to describe him under the umbrella of laysa kamithlihi shay. Under the umbrella of these large verses in the Quran that explain his divineness and his holiness and the fact that he transcends our realm and our existence itself. But he'll use words that you can understand. Something causes ghadab. Okay, then I shouldn't do that. Something is rida. Oh, then I should do that. Istawa, oh, he's in control. Nothing is happening without him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, being on top of it. And that's why historically, and then of course you have something, the third, you, know, you have the, the, the attributes of God, the actions of God, and some of them can uh, be taken resemblance from if you don't understand metaphor. Remember, let's go back to yesterday. One of the mentalities that will lead to disbelief is a pure mechanistic way of thought. Or, uh, sorry, is, is, a, um, um, is a, a metaphor blindness way of thought. If you don't have the ability, if you don't have the ability to understand metaphor, then this will cause you problems. It will cause you a lot of problems. You, you will lose the ability to understand Allah's being strange to. And the third thing is, There are things that are neither attributes nor actions. Like what? Seven things. Al-yadu, wal-qadamu, wal-aynu, wal-saqu, wal-asabi'u, wal-wajhu, wal-shakhs. These are seven, uh, seven sifat that exist in, uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I can't say that Allah subhanahu I can't describe Allah as a yad, as a hand. No, I can describe him as, a, as, as, as merciful, but I can't describe him as a hand. I can't say his action, ghadab. Yes, I can say ghadiba, meaning he, 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 his wrath is, is put upon something. But I can't say his action is the hand. Then what is the hand? It's neither an attribute nor is it an action. It's something that the Muslim scholars throughout history have done one of two things. Either they have done tafwil, which if they said, we don't know what this means. We don't know what it means, and we're not going to ask, and we just leave it as it is. And that was okay for the first 250 years of Islamic existence. No problem. People could do that. Meaning, what does it mean by al-qadam? This is, again, this is not modern. This isn't, we didn't start doing this as Muslims now. This has started 1,200 or 1,300 years ago. So what do you say? What is, what is, what is, Allah's face, what does that mean? What does that mean? We don't ask the question. That's what they did. 
And then another group, Sha'ir al Maturidiya, also Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they did something called Ta'wil. Ta'wil means they understand the metaphor behind it. They said, Wajah means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because Arab, whenever they want to refer to someone, they refer to him by his face. They use the word face to refer to him. The word yad, hand, is a metaphor in Arabic to, to actually describe power or strength, etc., etc., etc. So the Muslims did one of two things. Either they just said, we don't know what this means, or they said, metaphorically, it means one of this thing or that thing. But no Muslims, huh? this is way before any of these arguments became yani, popular today, no Muslims ever said that he has a mechanical hand, a physical like ours. No Muslims ever did that. I mean, there's not one Muslim scholar that ever claimed that when Allah subhanahu wa says he has a ayn, for example, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has an eye similar to ours. Actually, when you're talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you describe hand or uh, leg or foot or uh, fingers, or you're not allowed to use gestures that may guide someone to, to, to elude someone to think that it's similar to what you're talking about. So if I say Allah's eye, I can't, I don't point to my eye because that's not acceptable. And this is, this is the hadith of the Sahaba عنه, from the Prophet because it's not appropriate because there's nothing, there's no simil there's nothing to be drawn. There's no similarity. So why is he using it? Because there's the only way the human brain can actually comprehend God. You need something. You need to give me something. Something to me, help me understand you. Because my brain is only able to draw parallels from the universe around me. If you're outside of the universe, that means I have nothing to draw to. But give me something just enough so that I can connect with you, so I can feel relevance. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose certain words in the Quran. For example, Arsh al Kursi, for example, another example. The throne and the chair. The throne and the chair are the physical, are they are the creations of God? Of course they're creations of God. But what are exactly are they? Do I imagine an actual chair or an actual uh, throne? No, we can't do that. Then what am I going to do? Well, either we do tafwil and we say we don't talk about that because we don't understand it. I don't think that answer works anymore today. As much as I love it, Mufawwila and I grew up that way, I don't think it works anymore because you have to bring answers or else people can't, uh, you know, people just walk away. Metaphorically understand what Arsh and Kursi means for Arabs. Al Arsh was, the, was where everything returned to, meaning the... Uh, uh, the initiation of, of operations, that's where that the Arsh means. Min uh, al-Arish, where all the, the vineyards would come and that's where they would start. Al-Kursi is a word that is used to a place where all knowledge is taken. That's why if, if you go to, uh, to any of the Muslim countries and you want to go and learn a madhab, uh, anyone know Sheikh, uh, um, what's his name, Saeed al-Kamali? Yeah, what does he sit on? What is, he, what, is, what is his thing called? Do you know what it's called? It's called Kursi al-Imam Malik. It's called kursi, even though he doesn't sit necessarily on a chair. But kursi is mean, this is where all the knowledge of Imam Malik is put, because that's what kursi means to Arabs. So metaphorically, al-Arsh and al-Kursi is meaning the control and the knowledge, and, but used in the form that the Arab could understand, or used in using words that allow you to comprehend what he's talking about, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you either do tafwil and say, we don't know, or you understand it metaphorically, but either way, you're not allowed to say kursi and then you look at a chair and you're not allowed to do that. That's haram. That's kufr. Islamically, way before these arguments existed, way before yani, Hawkins and Dawkins and uh, yani, Hitchens and all these guys came around, before that, the Muslim is haram for you to actually take anything that Allah describes himself with and then say, it's similar. he has a hand and then put your hand up. No, 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 that's not acceptable at all. That's an act of shirk or kufr. You're not allowed to do that. Where does the problem come? The problem comes with the metaphor blind mentality where they read a hadith ahad, a hadith that were narrated to us by one or two sahabi from the Prophet ﷺ, one or two sahabi of the Prophet ﷺ, companions of the Prophet ﷺ. And then they read the hadith and they refuse, they, they decide they're going to understand it literally. They refuse to understand it metaphorically. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam uh, on, on, at his image. By the way, uh, the Quran doesn't have any of that in it. That wording in the hadith is actually a biblical term. It's from the Torah. The Torah has that in it, right? The difference between the Torah and the Quran, or the, the Torah and Jin and the Quran, the Quran never ever talks about the existence of God in our universe, ever. If you want like some lines, the Quran never ever points out that God, anyhow, in any form or manner, existed inside of our universe physically, ever. Allah, Quran never talked about actions of God that had within it movement, 
the had within it walking, the had within it anything that you can attribute to the actions of a human being that are specific to a human being. The only thing that we have is Kalam Allahu Musa Taklima, and that has its own, uh, yani, uh, uh, its own explanation within the Quran that we'll come to, inshallah, at a certain point. But that even that is very clearly defined in terms of what it's meant. On the other hand, you have in the Bible, no, you have descriptions that are very physical. Very physical, where he wrestled and he fought and he talked and he and he and he, and he, and he sorry and he walked and he bled and he. We have Jalla Jalalullah Subhanallah Taala Amma Yasifun. The Quran doesn't have any of that. In Hadith Al Ahad, in in a Hadith that are attributed to one or two Sahaba who narrated to us. Yes, the chain of narration is authentic. There are certain things that if you choose to understand it literally, it can cause you some problems. Like the Hadith Allah created Adam Ala Suratih. There's a million ways to understand that. So ala suratihi, meaning as image physically? No, obviously, because we just explained laysa kimat liyashay. Then his image what? In terms of the ethics he can carry. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is kareem, you can be kareem. Allah is rahim, you can be rahim. Allah is ghafoor, you can be ghafoor. That's what he meant. Very simple. It's not, it's not hard. Like, it's very, very, very easy. The hadith where akhadat al-rahimu bi hiqwi al-rahman. Where the, where, the, where the rahim, which is the uh, relationship of kin, of kin, meaning uh, blood relations, on the day of, uh, when it was created, it takes... Hiqwi rahman The word hiqw is basically waste. So bi hiqwi rahman the waste of a rahman Well, are we talking physically here? Well, first of all, is rahim a physical thing? Like, is, is, is the relationship of kin a physical thing? It's not even a physical thing to begin with. So how is the basic... The whole thing is metaphorical, obviously. But it's a beautiful hadith. I love the hadith. Because the, the rahim will say, Ya Rabb, yani, I want my rights. So Allah will tell it, are you not happy? Are satisfied that I will only connect with those who connect you, and I will break off those who break you off. I mean, those who ruin their family ties, I will get rid of them, and those who, who hold on to their family ties, I will strengthen my connection with them. It's a beautiful hadith. It strengthens family. Are you going to understand it literally? No. Understanding it literally is a complete waste of time. It's not, it makes no sense at all. And then you have a lot of ahadith that are similar. A lot of ahadith, there's, there's, there's quite a bit. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm done, I'm running out of time. But there's a lot of ahadith that are like that. You can go and you can look them up and see them one by. by uh, one after the other, they're not very complicated. All you have to do is understand them metaphorically. Why do we have to understand them metaphorically? Well, because the Quran told us to. It's not because I'm telling you to. It's not because I want to get out of an argument that I'm losing with some other. No, no. Because the Quran said so. The Quran said, Laysa It said, Allah nuru samawati wal ard. The Quran explained to us who God was. So when we're given these descriptions that may seem that they're resembling the human being, they don't because we have an umbrella. We have an umbrella concept that's already installed into our deen that helps us deal with these types of understanding. But these metaphors exist, these figures of speech are there. Well, why would he use them? Because we require a certain degree of relevance. As human beings, our brains require some degree of relevance. That relevance allows us to understand God, connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a little bit more. If you remove all of these attributes and descriptions, then we struggle. If, it's, if you're struggling now to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, imagine how hard it would be if there were no descriptions at all that you could draw any parallels to in your mind or have any relevance towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of. So that's why these things are there. So that's an example of a straw man fallacy. How the image of God that people are like, I don't want to believe in that God. And we're like, well, we agree with you. We don't want to believe in that God either. We totally don't, we totally believe, don't believe in that God. But because we're clumped up with the group, and this strom and fallacy allows them to kind of continue to poke holes at a God that we don't even believe in. We can't seem to get ourselves out and say, this is actually what we believe Allah to be. Yes, we believe Allah to be divine, to be holy, to be beyond time and space. He's not human. He does not have human attributes. And he does not, he's not emotional like we are. He does not, that's not what he is. And why are these words in the Quran? These words are metaphorical. They're used there to draw relevance, to allow us to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to be able to comprehend what he is saying. But we understand every time we use them that there's no way that we're going to say this is exactly the way we do it, or it looks the way we look, or it, be, or, or, or it functions the way we function. It doesn't. And that, is, that predates any of these modern scientific arguments regarding God. It predates it by a lot. So I'll end with that, inshallah ta'ala. That's over 50 minutes. Uh, we'll continue, inshallah, tomorrow with, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about, inshallah, the second source, which is uh, yani, uh, life. And we'll go through a little bit of uh, yani, uh, the theory of evolution, inshallah, as well. Subhanahu wa bihamdik. Shalom la ilaha illa anta astaghfir wa tubu ilayk wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Yeah, I'm okay taking questions regarding what we talked about. So regarding what we actually talked about, nothing outside of what we talked about. So don't ask me a question that we haven't covered yet. You're welcome to ask about what we, what we covered in terms of... Um, of, of the points, just because I have a lot to cover still. So if you ask me now, then you're going to throw me off and then you know, waste time. Go ahead. 
You have a question? Okay. Does anyone have a question? Do you have a question? Privately? Okay. I have a question. Yeah, go How do you address God of the gaps policy? Yeah, so God of, God of gaps, uh, we'll talk about tomorrow when we go a little bit more deeper into um, uh, into science, like meaning tomorrow when we talk about life, we're going to cover a little bit more of how science approaches certain things, um, because it's it's a, it's it's also a fallacy. Like it's it's a fallacy that we'll I'll cover tomorrow. Shall I tell you? But it, it's it's a part of tomorrow's. Uh, uh, Anything else? Okay, Zakum Lakhir. Alhamdulillah. Inshallah, Allah ilaha illa Anta Taqulu Tuulik. Wa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Muhammad Yasir. Bismillah. Zakum Lakhiran. Barakallahu Fiqum. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Barakallahu Fiqum. Please, we will put up a a, a forum for feedback. You're welcome to. to I, I would I would ask you all to, yani, uh, please fill it out. Uh, help guide maybe uh, help me know what this effort did for you and help me know how this effort could have been better and how to improve it in the future um, inshallah ta'ala so I'll, I'll put that up tomorrow it'll be like a, a, a QR code and just, just fill in I may, I may even put it on the WhatsApp group um, just to, if you're attending just tell me just give us some feedback in terms of how this is going and what, 